You are tuning in to the human side of engineering and product development podcast, brought to you by Sarah Tech, where we bring you industry leaders and some of the brightest minds in engineering solutions and product development. I'm Andy Dio, your host. Join me as we discover the inspiring stories of the people behind the most innovative and game-changing solutions in the market today. So tune in and enjoy. Ken, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Andy. Well, glad to be here. Glad to have you. So you and I, we've known each other for quite a while. Uh, I first met you when you worked at MSC Software back in, I think, 2000 it was the year, wasn't it? I think that's when the AES was acquired, yeah, or 2001. But yeah, yeah 2000, 2001. Um, and you have been an engineer or an executive for a lot of company. Obviously, MSC uh, was one of them. You're, you're now retired and is a, an executive consultant or a consultant. Uh, to companies who are looking to improve product development. So that's why I asked you to be on our podcast. And thank you very much for taking the time to be on with us. Um, one of the things that I I saw on your bio is that you attended UCLA. Now, we're going way back now. Uh, and and one thing that I found out is you, are, you were actually a, a runner on a track team at UCLA. Is that right? Yeah, I was on the track and cross country teams. I wasn't. I wasn't that good. I was a walk on, but uh, but at least uh, for a couple of years I did. I ran a few meets, both for cross country and for track, and then uh, also continued to train with the team, even if I was just going to run uh, road races. So it was fun. That was definitely one of the highlights at UCLA for me. Clearly. Fantastic. I actually applied to UCLA. So when I uh, applied for college, I applied to all the UC school. I love UCLA. I got in, but I was deferred to spring quarter and, you know, I couldn't wait. So I, I decided to uh, to go to UC Irvine instead. But yeah, I, I love UCLA. A beautiful campus, obviously historic. Love love that place. Well, UCI, I live just down the street from it. So uh, <laughs> I know that as well. Yeah. And another thing that I that I know about you since we've known it for, is you are a big art fan. And you and you have a, a a pretty pretty good art collection. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, my wife and I collect contemporary art, uh, both art glass to some extent and to a greater extent uh, paintings. In fact, over my shoulder here is one of the uh, one of the paintings by a local artist named Jimmy Gleason. We've got about five or six of his paintings. He paints in what's called uh, dichroic. Uh-huh. Paint. So as you move your head, as you move around the color of the painting changes. So it'll be go from dark blue to very, very pale blue, for example, this one behind me. And we've got paintings in, in every room of the house. We've got about 50 paintings, I guess. And um, so that's that really has been uh, has been a lot of fun collecting, collecting all that. We've run out of wall space and places for the glass and for the paintings, but <laughs> that, that's fine. Need, it's a good problem to have. You need a bigger house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... <laughs> Not in this market, right? <laughs> no, no. So I also uh, study art at UC Irvine. Uh, so I, I love and appreciate art. But when you talk about art, art and engineering, I see a lot of parallel between art and engineering. Um, some people may, may not see that, but I do. Uh, I don't know what what your feeling is uh, is about that, but in from my perspective, you know, artists and engineers, you have to be very creative. Uh, and you have to use your mind and 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 creative uh, juices to solve problems and and to create. Um, you know, engineering is also very visual as well. So I, I see a lot of correlation there. Do, do you see that? Yeah, creativity was the word I was going to use before you had said it. That I think you have to be both. You're, you're problem solving, so you need to be creative in uh, in doing so. So I think that's that's a big part of it, and the visual aspect is another part. There's another aspect too, and again, this, again with this painting behind me, um, I've talked to the artist, and he, again, he uses this dichroic paint. So there's a whole process that's involved here too. And I've got some other paintings that um, where you go, "Wow, how did he do that? How did she do that?" And and so there's sort of that uh, 
I don't want to say technology factor too, but there's kind of that, that G whiz type thing too. And so we like, uh, we also like paintings that have that as a, as an aspect as well. Yeah. And speaking of process, I know that you have authored or co-authored over 40 different publications. And, and, and in some of those, you talk about processes. So, you know, our podcast, the title of it is The Human Side of Engineering and Product Development. Product development is a process, isn't it? Um, how would you define product development process? Well, I would say product development to me encompasses everything from cradle to grave about a product from the time it's conceived until the time it's thrown away, if you will. And there, at least from the engineering standpoint, there is a process going from concept design to detailed design to manufacturing and to product support. Those are kind of the four main areas that I, that I see. Now you might say product support. Why would you even include that? Well, Think of anything around your house. It, most of these things had, had were developed, may have taken a year or so to develop them, but their useful life could be 10, 15 years or more. So actually the product support area is actually the longest area in, in product development. Now, people don't tend to think of that. A lot of they think, okay, we've developed it, thrown it over the wall, someone's bought it, we wipe our hands of it. But at least the responsible manufacturers, that's not the case. I mean, if you think about some of these airplanes, um, some of these have been have been flying for 30, 40 years, and the and uh, Boeing or Airbus or whomever has to has to uh, answer to them if there's if there's an issue. So so product support is maybe an overlooked area, but it definitely is a uh, is a big area. I think we're more we're more um, probably attuned to design and manufacturing. Yes, and um, and I'd say and those are certainly important, but but so again is is concept designer, the concept as well as product support area. So I sort of a cradle to grave, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really good point. The maintenance part or support part is often forgotten um, to be included as part of product development, but it, it, it really is because your product is truly, never truly is finished. There's always improvement. There's always things that you have to do after it's been released, updates, as you may say. Um, so it's it certainly is an important element. Now, your background, you are a CAE expert. That's what I would call you. Uh, so your, your career and, and focus has always been in CAE. Um, that's a pretty big part of, pro of uh, product development, I think. And it's I know in the past 20, 30 years, since the 90s, design has always been, you know, the the sexy part of product development, as you would say, right? Mm -hmm. They get all the attention. I remember back in the early day when uh, I remember we were showing a, a software and we were able to shade a part and spin it on the screen. And I, you gotta, you gotta remember, this is back in the in the nineties. People were just blown away, like, "What? I can't believe you can do that!" You know. But it's all the the pretty pictures are nice, but I think the analysis or simulation part of the process is very important as well. And I think it, it's starting to get more attention. Uh, a lot of companies are talking about upfront design verification and how important it is, but that's that's not really a new concept, is it, Ken? Is it's been around? No, it, it, it it's been around. It, actually, it's been around. I'm going to say forever. Um, for example, if I go back to the uh, to the 1970s in aerospace, and maybe maybe even the 60s, I, I was involved from the 70s. You, we were doing simulation before the detailed design was being done. Now, people today may say that was up in the concept stage, right? You've got a very coarse yeah. model and you're, you're running some quick, uh, some quick types of, uh, of analyses to, to, uh, to check some things out before all the sizing has been done. But, um, but at the time, that, that was done there. Now, that was in aerospace. That was not necessarily true for, for any of the other industries. And in fact, a lot of the... Um, so-called designers and the analysts were, were the same people at that time. Yeah. Now, as time has gone on, as computers have proliferated, we've, we've gotten specialists, and then you sort of had 
I call a little bit of a bifurcation between design and analysis. But if I'm thinking of product development, I actually put three things into the, call it the design phase or the design process part of it, if you will. N number one is the actual design. Number two is the verification. Will this design perform as intended? Right, you've got a set of requirements. You're you're comparing the design to the requirements. And, and by the way, CAE is not the only way to do it. You can do that by test. You can do it by inspection. There are other ways to do it as well. And then the third aspect is what I would call design improvement, or some people might call design optimization. But you want to make your design better. Now that you have a feasible design, can you make it better? Can you take more weight out of it, or something like that? Yeah. I want all of those in what I call the design, uh, the design phase. Okay, the design activity to me yeah. include is design, verification, and improvement, and and then as and then once everything's signed off, then of course then it goes to manufacturing. Right, right, and there's still a lot of silos out there. You you wrote an article a while back uh, about consolidating the product development process into a single process. Um, so what are some of the benefits and what are some of the challenges in doing that? So I think, I think the benefits are that you, you take a holistic view of your, of your product. A again, from concept through support, okay? I think we've all, we've all been a little bit frustrated with having products after we bought them, we've had some problem with it, and it's a pain dealing with support or something breaks yeah. or whatever, or you wish it had been designed better so it wouldn't have broken. But, it, but at any rate, I think having that holistic view will help you make better products. And, and I can point to there are companies that do that. For example, in uh, the defense companies, you have, you have these program managers, right? Maybe the JSF program manager. He or she wields all the power across the whole thing, cradle to grave for that product. But you go to many other companies, and that's not the case. You've got your you've got your design group, you've got your manufacturing group, you've got your support group that may even be off to off to the side or something. Yeah. And so I think you've got then in that case the challenges you've got are the handoffs from the groups, and it's not just. I mean, it's, it, there's technical handoffs or technology handoffs and data, but also just communication. I mean, again, Andy, think of some product you've used maybe that's broken. You would hope that the people in product support, when they knew about it, would communicate back to the designers or maybe back to the manufacturing group or both, and so that it, that can be rectified so subsequent releases of it are, are better off. Now, actually, the group that probably does the best of that, or the industry that does the best with that, is probably software. Mm -hmm. right? always, in, in software, you've got your support group, and they're always feeding things back to software development or to the product managers or whatever. And that seems that seems to help because it, it, it must, the software gets updated every year or so, right? Sure. So, so more so than, than hardware does, at least for the most part. Yeah. So the challenges then become these these uh, fiefdoms or these silos. And how do you how do you overcome that, both by technology and by human interaction too? I mean, the, for example, you mentioned earlier um, about going – say from CAD to CAE. Okay. Right. Again, I consider all that part of design, but still, okay. They are often separate groups within, within engineering. Right. And I know there was one company that actually solved that by, and they had the same issues everybody else did. You know, the, the CAE guys are analyzing the wrong version of the, of the design. By the time the CAE is done, the designs changed five times. I mean, all this stuff. And yes, technology will help with that. But this one company said, okay, forget it. Yeah, we'll do whatever we can technology, but we're going to seat the people together. We're going to put them side by side physically. Now, this obviously is years before COVID, right? <laughs> but but they but then then they became responsible for the design and the verification aspect. So call it an, an analysis verified design. Both groups were responsible for that, so they worked together to do that. That was not a technology. Thing. Yeah. That was that was a, a human thing or organization or whatever you want to call it. Not every company has that that option. Companies uh, outsource different things. You get supply chains. I mean, it, it it is more complicated than just being able to seat people together. But that's one example of how people have overcome that. Yeah, I mean, thinking of COVID now, a lot of companies have people across the world. And 
gone are the days when you have everybody in the same building or same space. So how does that add to this to this challenge, Ken? Because I, I, I see that as a huge obstacle sometimes in engineering and, and how do companies overcome that? Well, I, I, first off, it is a challenge. I mean, even, even people, you've got different languages, yeah. you've got people in different time zones. I mean, even, even in Southern California, you've got people just spread around Southern California. So it just doesn't matter whether you're across the country or next door, if you're not physically co-located, it's an issue. And, and I think that's the human aspect of the communication that gets lost. And I think you really have to strive to try to, to try to get that, you know, we're not standing around the water cooler anymore. Right. Using that analogy. So, so I think that definitely is a challenge. Now, part of the way you can solve it, I think some of the technology things will help where you can have uh, things like uh, markup on your drawings and things like that. So you, or you can get on, share the computer. I mean, all that stuff helps, but frankly, I think it becomes a mindset. Andy. You just have to tell yourself you're going to do it. it at, um, at Siemens PLM, or I guess DISW now it's called. Yeah. I had a group. We were the uh, CAE pre-sales and um, in business development. And I was in California. Everybody else was in the East Coast and almost everybody else. So yeah. we were all dispersed, but we had to make up our minds. We were going to communicate and we were going to pick up the phone and do it. Email was not enough. I'm a big email fan. Yeah, but that that that's not enough, and so you had to, you definitely had to communicate. And any meetings we had were pretty much about communication, making sure that everybody sort of knew what everybody was was doing. Not not the most efficient, but again, I think you have to put your mind to it. So I think with COVID and the challenges that's brought, Andy, I think people have got to take the extra step to communicate with their with their colleagues and their peers and whatnot. And um, and I think company, I think. Companies are trying to do that. I think most of them are. Yeah. I mean, ideally, the concept of collaboration is very attractive, right, on paper. But as we all know, collaboration is difficult. True collaboration. You have to have the infrastructure. You have to have, uh, as you mentioned, the willingness of people to engage uh, we spoke earlier about silos. Just be, due to people's job function, location, natural silos are created. And it is a huge issue, I think, uh, in the industry, not just our industry in engineering, but I think in every industry. Um, there, there's just a, a natural tendency for people to be um, you know, it's us versus them, even though you're in the same company. Yeah, and, and yeah. specializations too, Andy, right? So yeah. you want to be, you want to be, um, you're proud of your specialization yeah. and, and you want to, you want to do that. And you may, you may run your task and optimize things for your task, but in the context of a broader process, that might not be uh, a good thing. For example, let's, let, let's stick with for a minute with uh, CAD and CAE. Yeah. And, um, I know there was one company years ago, the uh, the designers, because of the union, they somewhere in the unions, the designers were not allowed to run any analysis. So, and by the same token, the analysts were not allowed to touch any CAD. So right off the bat, you had, you, you had a challenge there. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so there was that. Now there are, there is some technology that'll help with that, but, but still when you're, when you're doing CAE, you don't just go and access the geometry blindly and then start start meshing it. I mean, what what do you what is the design intent? What are the requirements? What is if you think if you were doing a test, a physical test, you would write a test plan. Well, doing analysis, you should write a virtual test plan if you go an analysis plan. So what is it that you're trying to do? What's the goal? What are you trying to accomplish? What are what are you verifying against? What are the what are the goals that you're going after? Uh, and I think another thing too is the uh, what what gets in the way is the um, the compensation. Hmm. And so, for example, the des the designers may be compensated with how many designs they can put out, how, how many how many drawings to use right. they can put out. Right. But yet, if your design is not, I'll call it watertight. If it's not a thing that can be meshed, then the analyst has to spend his or her time trying to zip it up and figure out how to how to be able to make it or adopt the geometry so it can be meshed. But then, so you would think that from a process standpoint, just for that alone, 
if you if if the both the um, designers and the analysts were compensated on analyzed designs or verified designs as opposed to the number of designs that get done in any unit time, then I think that would be better off. That's just a small example. Yeah. But, but it's a very it's a very uh it's a very big example of what does go on today. Yeah. If you were to start a brand new engineering product development company, what would be the most important thing for from your standpoint of view um, to look at to implement a process that is um, efficient and effective across the organization, especially for growth? How, how would you do it? Well, first off, I, I would I would step back and I would I would probably look at uh, two different aspects, but both would be tied, and I would have variable compensation tied to that. So, for example, um, I would incent the people for, who are doing the the concept, who are doing the design, which includes the analysis, and the um, and the manufacturing. I, there would be incentives based on based on like getting the products out and how well the products perform. But I would probably have a second incentive that had to do something with product support, just because that's, that, that is a longer uh, time period. And, yeah. and so I would start with common. Actually, I think the second thing I would have would be the common incentives. The first thing I would have would be the goals. What are the goals? What is it we're trying to do? And yes, here is a company is what we're trying to do. And you're, you're, and this is what we expect each of you to do. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of this about uh, UCLA and that I was on the track and cross country teams uh-huh. there. Okay, track and cross country is an individual. There are individual sports that things are added up at the end. Okay, right. so so in track, the guy running the five k is not going to help the shot putter, and the shot putter isn't going to help the high jumper, who's not going to help the triple jumper. Right? I mean, right. You do the things, you add up your marks, how you score, that's it. You're on your own. And you hope everybody does a good job. Basketball, on the other hand, is not that way. You've right. got you've got to all work together. I think we need to make business. If I was doing a make building a product development company, make it more like a basketball team than a track team. Right. No, that's that's a great analogy. Uh, teamwork, right? It's it's always the key. Now, what if you are not starting a new company? You are an existing company. And we know a lot of them out there that have issues or have problems with product development, whether they want to admit it or not. Uh, some companies succeed in spite of the issues and challenges mm-hmm. that they mm-hmm. have. You know, um, how would an existing company approach solving or consolidating their product development process? I think the first thing I would do would be to look at the process, understand for each person what he or she does and what the inputs are to that function and what their outputs are. And so start mapping that, if you will, and try to understand and then try to understand where the biggest gaps are. And I would not try to to boil the ocean there. I try to solve a few gaps at a time. I would come up with some type of process improvement proposal that looked at the at the bigger issues to solve, or at least uh, of the multiple issues to solve. And yeah. try to knock those off um, one at a time. I might actually start with some of the simpler ones first because you want to get some wins under your belt, if you will. Because there's no, nothing breeds success like success. So sure. you want to be able to show people that the pain of going, if it will, and, and people don't like change, so they'll consider it a pain. Doesn't matter what the change is, by the way, they'll consider it a pain. So you want to show them that there's benefit to be gained by this. So, so start with some of these. Don't try to again. Don't try to optimize the cradle to grade process, but look at specific um, handoffs or interactions from some typical from some areas. So again, from CAD to CAE, for example, okay, would be one. I mean, another big one, of course, is going from from design to manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Um, or another one, frankly, is is getting feedback from people in the field, or you know, in your product support phase, getting that information back to um, to design and to uh, to manufacturing, so they can do better if they if they update the uh, the product. So those those would be some of the things I would do, Randy. Is I would understand the process, but as far as implementation, I would I would bite off a few things first and then try to try to work work from there. Because I think getting 
some incremental progress is better than waiting years to, to solve everything because it probably ain't going to happen because of human nature. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I think you mentioned just the integration or exchange of data between design and CAE. Um, it seems like every company should have that nailed down by now, but reality is it's not, is it? There's, no. there's still a lot of inefficiencies out there. Yeah, there still are. Um, and, and CAE, and, and I think maybe it's the, maybe it's the more conservative, tends to be the conservative nature of engineers. You don't want to bless something until you're 200% sure that it's right. And by then the design has changed three or four times perhaps. And so, so what did you do? So I think, I think technology helps. But again, I think close communication can also help. I, I think some other things that will help, frankly, is having the designers. I, they could do some upfront analysis, but, but you don't have to go all the way. You could just make it so that when they consider that their design is ready to be verified, that it has to be measurable. You could set it up so they could do the mesh. That would be a test for them on their side. And I think then that would, that would make things a little bit faster. I think that, that's a quick thing that could be done. As long as you're using the same geometry foundation, if you will, in your CAD and your CAE, should be a no-brainer. And that would be one of the first things I would look at would be, and you could set it up with macros that are in software to be able to, to auto mesh. And if they can't mesh it, the designers can't mesh it, at least for, for some easy structures, you got a problem. And so, but the better people to solve that would be the design, solve that on the design thing, not on the, on the analysis side. Yeah. And speaking of that, um, companies like Siemens, DISW have created tools. I know in NX CAD, there are templates and and uh, what you call wizards mm -hmm. that designers can use to do upfront design verification very easily, right? Yes, yes. So there's a stress wizard and a vibration wizard, yes, that you could. So they could be trained, the designers could be trained to do that. I believe also the analysis group could also then write some macros to, make, to help automate some of that as well. And so there are some things that could be done. I don't think it's just one piece of things. I think if they can mesh, I think if they could use the wizards, I think there are probably some rules, there may be some, some design rules, there may be several different things. I don't think it's going to be one size fits all that's going to that's gonna make things better. But what your goal should be to get a verified design as quickly as possible. That's going to save you time and it's going to give you more time to do to do other things if indeed if indeed you you've got uh, can use that more time. Yeah. That's some great advice. So my takeaway from, from our conversation today is we have to try to break down the natural silos that occur in the product development process, either by um, interacting or, or working with the people or implement systems and processes that allow that communication to, to happen. Um, the other thing that I, the other takeaway that I, I got from conversation with you is start small. Don't try to solve all the problem at once. Start with an area where you can make the most direct and immediate impact and go from there. Um, so those are two key things that I took away. Uh, were there any any other things that, that you think are, are key points of view? that? Well, I, I would expand a little bit on that second one that you said about getting the, the quick wins. I think not only get the quick wins, but then publicize it internally so that people know that it was a quick win. And so that they, that they know that they got the win. And what does that mean for the business? And what does that mean for them? There may well be some variable comp tied to it or something like that. So it's not just it's not just getting the win, but make sure that people understand that they got the win, and and make here make heroes out of people. I'm, I don't like the the things where you you rely on the heroes because then then that becomes problematic. Yeah. But I think you can still make heroes in the overall course of doing some of these changes, and that's so that's important. So celebrate your successes. Uh, I think that again, nothing breeds success like success. But if you don't know that you got success. What is there to celebrate? So, so make sure that you promote that internally. Absolutely. Well, Ken, uh, again, it's I can't believe it's been thirty minutes. The conversation just flies by, but a lot of useful and great information. 
So glad to have you on the podcast today, and I really appreciate your time. And hopefully, we'll see you back again soon on another episode. Thank you.